Welcome to another episode of Running Greenleaf, where we go through the nitty gritty of operating real estate. I'm here today, I've got myself, got Josh, and the running man, Andrew Ziffer. So we're gonna go through a couple points that are relevant to what we see going on right now. So let's dive in and get to it. So, so good, fast, cheap. Can, can you have them all? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I, kinda, I want them all. It's, it's kind of something we think about and we're looking at you know, all the time and kind of our thought process, right? But those three points, it's called the iron triangle. You know, it's interesting from operating a business, thinking about those, those points on how you, make, uh, how you make decisions. We're stuck with making decisions right now. We're not stuck, but um, making long-term decisions right now. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, so fast, cheap, what, like, what, what are we compromising? Right, because the, 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 the iron triangle, right? <laughs> we have good, we have fast, we have cheap. We always want good. Well, you don't know. You know it's, a, it's a toss up, but the theory is you can only have two of them, and whatever two you pick, you sacrifice the other one. Right? So if you're going to do something good and fast, it won't be cheap. If you're going to do something fast and cheap, it won't be good. Um, so home, home flippers are, uh, are, are fast and cheap. Fast and cheap. So normally not going to be super good. We look at our operating platform and what we're trying to accomplish. We are looking to uh, be strong operators that do not do things cheaply. So therefore, probably not going to be the, the fastest. And that's why we don't flip because we can't, that doesn't fit our decision-making process, doesn't fit what our team is. Uh, so everything we kind of have is more geared towards uh, operate and hold. Yeah, I think you know, now really sh shines a light on the sensitivity of timing the market. And if the, you know, the people that bought say one to three years ago that said they're going to exit in 2023 or they're going to exit in 2024 and that's a determined like they have to exit but they're stuck holding these properties uh it's gonna be really tricky to be fast and cheap but not good <laughs> yes yes <laughs> we're trying to make sure we're looking at our investment strategy going into 2024 and in and, and kind of not having to have a lot of defensive situations in 2024 so we can be offensive in the market that's there um and then make good decisions for the long term in that environment. So won't be flipping anything in the in the near term. Really, I mean that's we've only we've done that a couple times on retail. That's pretty much it. Where we've been able to go in significantly reposition something based on lease structure and then right. exit. And but that's just a piece of paper. It's also not we're we're not doing a capex project. We're not spending a lot of money. We're simply negotiating a piece of paper, and that piece of paper is what creates the value versus. With a single family house, you're going in there and spending fifty, a hundred thousand dollars house, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to fix it up. Yeah. And hopefully make yeah. fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, if you can double your money, the faster you do it, the higher your internal rate of return is right. gonna be. And and when that person, the end user, buys the house, uh, they only find out the problems uh, three months after they moved in. So the uh, the investor is long <laughs> since out of it. It's over at that point, it's yeah. It's over, yeah. Oh. So we're, we're trying to get aggressive, you know, now and really into 2024 on how do we sign renewals? How do we sign extensions with our lenders? And basically, how do we, how do we push things forward throughout the year um, into 2025 and 2026 so that we can have more capacity to, for buying power? Yeah. Yeah, that's really a plan. And, and we're not going to do stuff fast right now. We're going to take our time, operate, make good decisions on, on what we operate with and look to continue to grow operating margins. I think strong operators right now who can have that longer term uh, mindset will perform well. I think they'll outperform, but we can come back to this and look in 18 months and see, which is right, if you should have been selling into this or, or trying to hold for the long term mm -hmm. and operate. But it'll be interesting to see, that's for sure. What do you want to go to next? City infrastructure. infrastructure yeah. uh... We've, this is something we... we we're always kicking this around and always talking about it as we look at our deals. But I think our, the incident we had at Fairway more brought this up, made it more uh, top of mind as we're looking at deals. And uh, this is a deal we have. It's in the city of Atlanta. It's next to, you know, you, you rewind maybe 150 years. It was probably like a nice little rambling little stream. And now it's deep in the middle of the city. It is a completely paved river or stream. I, you know, what, what do you want to call that? Spillway. Where it's, yeah. yeah, spillway. I mean, it, it has water in it all the time, but it is completely paved with numerous bridges that go over it. And most of those bridges are, you know, at least 50 years old, maybe 100 years old. Um, 
and they have very narrow supports. They're not, uh, they're not even using arches. They're just straight up pillars that block these rivers. So frequently, all the debris that gets washed down or, or trash that gets pushed into it gets just blocked up behind those, those bridges and then the whole river overflows and, and floods. And we just had this happen at Fairway. It is, it is not the first time it's happened. Uh, you know, we've run into issues across many properties where we've had, Sugar Creek is a good example. Yeah, yeah so Sugar, Sugar Creek kind of runs, what, east-west of the city, uh, down really, really close to I-20. It just kind of like wiggles along I-20 going north and south. But we just happen to have seven, eight, and properties or maybe over the years we've had a dozen properties that touch sugar creek and every time there's a big storm it's there's nothing wrong with sugar creek what's wrong is the city infrastructure and the drainage and the trash in the city that clog up sugar creek and that may, that make the problem yeah that one's every time we look at that with our operating team we're like wait a minute we're on the same little creek because it goes through everything you remember the time we had the, the dump truck that pushed the dumpster over the dumpster pad pushed it into the river which then Block. backed up to the bridge and flooded the whole area. Yeah. It's like, we run into these situations that are, that are not really, you're like, ooh, that was a random one. That won't happen again, but they kind of keep happening. So we bring up city infrastructure and we look at that as an important factor for, we're making a decision on an investment or on a property if we're going to hold it or how we're going to operate it. Its relationship to the infrastructure around it is, is exceedingly important. And I think it's getting more and more important. Yeah, and this isn't just Atlanta. We're talking about Atlanta, but you know, if you look nationwide, we we're looking at a report that was saying that the average bridge in the United States is 116 years old. Yeah, so there's a... What was the name of that report? It's the National Bridge... What is that called? Inventory. Yeah, inventory. Yeah, yeah. National like, Bridge Inventory List. And it shows all the bridges throughout the U.S. It basically shows their inspection... Uh, report on what they had and then it shows the average age some of it's super cool like there's bridges from the 1700s that are still i think it said the oldest bridge is like 1647 or something crazy like that what's but, mind-blowing is these bridges over a century old and the volume of traffic they're getting on them you know hundreds of thousands of cars a day on a bridge that's a, a century plus yeah. old you look at it though if if the stuff hasn't been maintained some of them are old and been well maintained right. or you I don't think anyone looks at infrastructure across the country and is like, man, these are just exceptionally well-maintained. But a lot of it is very good and a lot of it is very well-maintained. But then there's some that's old and not maintained where you run into some, some issues there. And, and we've had properties that are located near these, these things and it, uh, you know, it, it needs to be in the decision-making process because it can cause chaos. That's kind of why we ended up getting rid of the Whiteford deal, mm -hmm. right? It was right on the river and, and it was close and, and uh, just the downstream risk was just like, ugh. We hadn't had anything happen in a long time on it, but still, you're kind of like, you're going to sleep always thinking about, man, there's a bridge 100 feet from this thing. If anything happens to that bridge, our property could be screwed. And we have no control over that. Yeah, and it's, it seems like politics are starting to get their hand on this a little bit, you know, with the Build Back Better Act and the American Jobs Act, but it, it seems to fall short of the demands, you know, the the... The American Jobs Act was a $1.2 trillion of approved money, but only $110 billion of it went towards bridges and infrastructure. So I, I, it's a step in the right direction, but there's still a lot, a lot to go. Yeah, it's a, that's a tough one. I mean, it, it, but it impacts every kind of property you, you could have, everything you could have. Because, I mean, that had rail, and you're talking about roads and bridges for the, hundred and, the $110 billion total. But, I mean, there's rail in there, too, and rail bridges that don't fall into the road bridges ones and uh, all that stuff's got to, you know, there's a lot of maintenance that's required just to keep that stuff going. Yeah. Which I think the last major investment in, in bridges and roads was, uh, it was the sixties, was it in the fifties and sixties? Was that, well, maybe was that, oh, that was, yeah, that was like yeah. Eisenhower's yeah. Uh, oh. interstate highway system plan. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was probably the last time. big push where you had, you know, a nationwide strategy or nationwide plan of what you're doing. Um, we're kind of smart, you know, we're not, we're not looking at giant highways that we want to you know, be Rebuild. involved in. We're just talking about like <laughs> the little, the, the, the local stuff that directly impacts small, small property owners. Um, that's where it's critical to, to have that in the, in the vision of when you're making any kind of decision. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know, it's maybe a little bit of a ramble on that one, but you know, it's coming into play more and more on how we're seeing our properties, whether we are holding and doing something long-term, like we don't want to see some of these surrounding issues that could just cause us 
you know, troubles two, three, five years down the road. You know, if your plan is to just get in and sell something two months later, you probably just don't care. Right. It's not a relevant point of your analysis. But if you're thinking five years or you're thinking long term cash flow holds, yeah, you got you need to be thinking about that stuff now. So, yeah. So moving on to uh, fixed income. Fixed income has uh, been, been a pretty popular topic lately yeah. with uh, rates rising. Um, you know, with, I mean, not only the 10 year, you know, risk free rate, the 10 year treasury now being put, you know, right around 5%. But, um, in, you know, the, you know, private equity markets, you can fix, in, you can, you can invest in really public securities, fixed income rated deals in the kind of 10 to 12% range. So it's, it's starting to get very, very interesting to invest in fixed income. And the theory is, is that if rates were, were to pull back, then the value of that bond or that, that, um, that fixed, uh, Instrument. Instrument. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes much, much more valuable if rates were to come down. Yeah, yeah we're looking looking at a couple options in doing that. We've always been trying to figure out, like, how do we get cash flow, right? That's always been what we've been looking at. So we got into real estate. That's why we like the net lease space, too, because, you you know, it's it's a little more fixed, fixed. Yeah. income. There's still work that has to be done, but it's not like an apartment complex that's, like, I'd say variable. It's variable link. Variable, not passive income. It's it's actively managed variable income. Uh, so, and, you know, there's challenges there. But if you look at just what other opportunities are there for fixed income debt, we've been looking at the market and we see challenges that are coming up or challenges that are in 2024. And we see kind of just opportunities to buy uh, on the note side. Yeah. So like whether it's a private lender that has a set balance sheet that they need to basically, re- you know, release some space in their balance sheet or some of our small um, community banks, well, it could create some opportunity to buy some notes off their books. And maybe they lent at 70% loan to value, but we can buy it off their books at a 20, 30, 40% discount to free up their their um, lending capacity. That can be tremendous. Yeah. there's We definitely feel like there's going to be opportunities for that stuff to happen. At some point, you need to. The loan balances will have to be turned over. Um, a lot of stuff's coming due in in twenty twenty four. We have worked for a long time to kind of push our notes out as long as possible. We've always been a fan of long term fixed rate debt, so we've pushed a lot out. I, we talked about one of the other ones, like twenty twenty seven, twenty twenty eight is really where we have a lot of stuff uh, that's coming up and coming due. But in the short term, we look at the next six months. Uh, there there should be opportunities to buy some of these notes that are coming out. Right. Yeah, without property selling, there's really no way to churn the balance sheet and free up capacity of these lenders. Yeah. The other thought too is uh, we're, we're looking at buying some stuff in bulk as well, mm-hmm. which could be pretty interesting. We're looking to look at a portfolio of debt options and you say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll buy those for percentage of their note balance. Um, and that way you're really getting value on that spread. You know, because the asset, if say an asset is worth $100 or the note's 100 and you can buy it at 60, it's like maybe it's worth 80, maybe it's worth 70. Obviously, it wants to be worth higher, higher, right. the, be- higher the better <laughs> because that's really where your yield and your value is coming from. Um, but finding those opportunities, and, and that's, you know, we've seen a significant number of, of more debt funds that have started in the past three months. We were like, hey, we're going to get popping into the debt nowhere, side. Everywhere. <laughs> and now they're kind of popping up and, and, Rates between, I said anywhere from 12 to 15, 16, which seems crazy high. With two points in and two points out, and they're only 12 month term, um, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty tricky to take on a note like that. Um, but I, on the lending side, you're, you're usually in a pretty good position because of your lower leverage and your, your first lien position. Yeah, th- some of these, though, are, we're talking people that just need that money to either get through finishing a project or get a project over the hurdle. And then they either plan they're hoping or, or I think they're hoping that 2024 will be better and they can exit. Hoping. Hope. Yeah. I don't I, Hope isn't always the best business plan, but yes. it's one. It's an option. It is an option. I, th- I mean, 2024, you know, my, my viewpoint is going to be opportunity to buy stuff in 2024 but probably not the greatest opportunity to sell stuff. We just went over what that looked like in our opinion. Um, so yeah, I think some of these debt options coming up, we're going to be, uh, they're going to be exciting. Hopefully we can get some, we can like actually look through in detail, right? We, we've talked to a bunch of different debt funds. We've talked to a bunch of different debt options that we could buy. 
We haven't pulled the trigger yet, but getting close. Getting getting close. Okay. Yeah. Between now and the end of the year, we should have something together. Something that we can look at. Yeah. 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 I I, I feel pretty optimistic about that as well. I I, I see that it's going to be there and, and be a good opportunity. Mm-hmm. So I think too, you, we got, us looking at it's like we got to be in the mindset like if we have to take over and operate that thing, we got to be able to do it. Right. So yeah. I would, we got a couple of next subjects we can go over too, but we, cap we rates. could talk about cap rates and yeah. reads. Cap rates are always fun. Yeah. <laughs> always fun. Then cap no, rates are always fun as long as they're being compressed. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, long as, we, <laughs> as long as there's a big spread between <laughs> cap rate and debt. How's that? Uh, yeah. yeah if there's remember, a, remember those days? If there's a giant spread between the cap rate and the debt you're paying, and then cap rates are always being compressed and debt goes down in, indefinitely. Yeah, it's exciting, but the days of three and a half percent debt are disappeared for a little bit. We're in the opposite opposite of that environment right now. Where we've got cap rates. We're starting to see some of our higher cap rate offers be entertained. You know, we, we buy two kinds of things. We buy stuff that's defunct with no cap rates. I mean, the majority of our right now, we, I mean, we've we've been bullish on buying defunct single story office. I would say it doesn't have a cap rate. It's ne- negative cap rate. They don't cash flow. It's it's vacant. So we got really... our first uh, nine cap. Yeah, I know. And if we look at the retail side, yeah. or we look at assets that are that are occupied and operating. Um, we put some offers out. Yeah, just in, just in recent memory here in the in the nine cap range that we're getting. Five months ago, there would have been no response on that, and now we're. Uh, we're, We're getting about feedback to go on that. Con- contract on one of these deals, yes. So it's it's finally happening. Cap rates are finally moving. Yeah, but cap rates moving. Exciting! You can buy stuff at a higher cap rate. You can earn more money on your yield. But now we've got this kind of valuation. It's good to buy, not. Well, what do you it. want to call that? That, that yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you look at your your valuations on paper of a lot of stuff, and they've got some of them have just gotten hammered. Yeah, especially in the public markets. The, the public yeah. markets have just been, yeah, completely flipped on their head. Well, the REITs, yeah, we, are, in, REITs are dying right yeah, now. Yeah, and public market REITs specifically, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If we look at uh, all of those operators out there, I mean, you can lump them by like the, the kind of the big operator REITs that you've got out there or by asset classes on REITs, but in general, they're, it, it's hard to just make a blanket statement because they're not all down. Some of them have outperformed and done very well and other ones are are down. Looks like we need to start buying data centers right now. <laughs> the data centers are outpacing the, the average. Yeah. Even single family housing is doing really well right now. Well, single family home prices are, you know, th- there's been some kind of like maybe turned down, yeah. but overall, I mean, they've been very high for the past. Yeah. And the cap rates don't really impact those. Yeah. So, and, but you uh, know, data centers that did, did well on the REIT side, but if you look at every other REIT, they're negative for the year. Did you, did you know that malls are not doing very well right now? Did you know that? Well, uh, mall, there's less. Uh, we should, I wish we knew the number of exactly how many fewer malls there are today versus there were 20 years ago. Because I think there's like fewer than 1,000 malls right now a thousand in America. Malls in the and US. there were like, now, now uh, I'm kind of just uh, guessing. Yeah, I think we've lost like 60% of our malls. Yeah, I think like, yeah, exactly. Like 50, yeah. 60% of the malls have gone away. So, yeah. so the ones that are still here are actually doing fairly well. Yeah, they're pretty pre- well occupied. Yeah. Rate, rates are Well, at least in Atlanta, we have Phipps, we have Linux, even mm-hmm. the one near my, me, Perimeter Mall. It's just, they're just destinations right now and they mm-hmm. still have nice brands and they still have, it's honestly a lot of. Um, there's stuff, I mean, yeah, Mall of Georgia, you go out there wet, mall, east of Atlanta, like it's busy. There's stuff going on. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think all, kind of a lot of the bad malls got, Got pushed out, and and uh, you know, looking at this REIT report, the shopping center asset class for REITs have really been flat for the year. When you look at a, like an office REIT is down eighteen to twenty percent. Yeah, and that's yeah. You're seeing these valuations impact the share price, and now we're seeing higher yields coming out of the coming out of the REITs. What was the you talking about yeah. Prologis? Yeah, so we were reading a report about Prologis earlier that. Uh, Prologis is, you know, it really just took off because of the the excitement with industrial, and it 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 went so high that the dividend went down to one and a half percent, and so Prologis is down around forty percent this year, but the dividend is up as a result of that, so it's up to about three and a half percent now, which is much more logical in in, in the realm of a normal read. So yeah. part of it is kind of an, a correction from a from a crazy market. 
yeah. especially in the public space where things can get offhand. At, it's at so easy to get in and out of, of the stock. Yeah. It, it can fluctuate easily, but they can't necessarily just get in and out of deals. Right. But Prologis is enormous it, operator. Um, yeah, yeah and, then, and then now they have a, if it's at a 3.5% yield, it's a pretty solid you know, distribution that they're making you know, from the REIT. That's more in line with 1.5% is super low. Yeah, so you and I were doing this study on one of the office REITs, looking at really the market cap of the REIT less the debt to basically value the equity left in it. And one of the ones we were looking at, it really the debt basis was around 130 a square foot. It was mostly suburban U.S. office buildings. It was well occupied, but the debt basis was 130 a square foot. And we were sitting there doing the math for our suburban office in Atlanta, which actually is performing very well. Yeah. But we have, I, I don't think we have over 100 a square foot in debt on really any of our assets. Maybe one or two of the medical no. deals, but it's, it's yeah, definitely not generic office. Yeah, not just like actually pure office. So it's like, ouch, are they just full underwater on equity? So, so Which, the, the little bit of equity that was left was only worth $10 a square foot. And we're sitting here saying, wow, this $10 a square foot is getting paid a 25% dividend. Is this a buy? <laughs> we, th we thought the debt basis was too high to get too excited about it, but yeah, man. But you, yeah, you're looking at getting into a REIT with a 20% dividend yield. <laughs> Can they make it four years? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, are you going to get your money out? <laughs> yeah. But, but maybe, I mean, I, there, there's definitely, looking at 2024, there's opportunities in this kind of stuff that are out there. So yeah, the valuations are hard to look at and being like, oh, they're definitely a, a punch in the gut. But on some of these, it's just bringing the yields back to Normal more stuff. of a reality. Yeah. So, so we kind of continues that thought of like going into 2024 and there's probably opportunities uh, around a lot of these assets that have been beaten up to pick them up at, at good values. Right. So speaking of that, let's talk about our most recent sale because we think we really, number one, we, I, we think we really hit it out of the park and outperformed the market. Number two, it might be a little bit of a pause be, between now and the next time we're going to see. A, a little? Uh, yeah. yeah. A little bit of a pause. Before we see a sub so, six cap rate exit. Yeah. So let's think about that one. That is the recent one we just sold was a dollar general in Charleston. And, and uh, we've been bullish on buying all sorts of the dollar store type entities. We have uh, bought the quick service restaurants into the net lease space. So we like this space and we've gone in with a business plan where we were going to uh, buy higher cap rate deals and then get a lease extension and then sell them at a lower cap rate. That was the business plan. The faster we could do that, the faster our IRR would be. So it's a little bit of maybe the opposite of what we we're saying earlier. Like it is a, it is a, create value quick strategy with the right work that went in place. And then worst case, we have uh, a long-term lease with the right escalations at a good value that we can hold and generate cash flow from. And a lot of the deals we've done this with, we've just kept and we're holding those and generating cash flow that we're happy with. Uh, in some instances, we'll take those out and look to exit and see, you know, what the market can provide us on a cap rate. And we were able to do that here on uh, our most recent Dollar General that we just sold. And so uh, Dollar General Charleston, we sold, uh, was it, um, well, it was um, September. Yeah. We bought it for uh, about one point. So we sold it right at the end of the, end of yeah. the third quarter. We, we so. literally timed this. This is probably the best time sale we're going to have probably in a while. So we sold it right at the end before cap rates started to rise. And we sold it for about a 1.67 million. We, uh, you know, and what's always interesting, um, we'll put this yeah. slide up, but you'll see this on the slide. We have, a, we have a planned project and then we have an actual project. And so for this one, it was really interesting to look at that we actually, what we planned and what actually happened. But we, um, first of all, this one worked better, better than plan, which is nice when that happens. But, you know, honestly, if everything works to plan, I think we'd be pretty happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if everything went to plan in real estate, it'd be incredible. Yes. But yes. That's like, it's, it's, what is that has like? never happened. Yeah. Well, we don't, yeah, we don't yeah, have anything but, that you goes know, exactly When you say never plan. happens, that's sometimes a good thing and sometimes not a good thing, but sometimes it's not fine. happening yeah. is a good thing. So in this case, it was a good thing where we planned a whole time of five years. We actually held it about two and a half years. Uh, we planned, yeah. we bought it probably at a high, a mid to high seven cap. We planned an exit with a longer lease about a seven cap, which we thought was fairly reasonable. However, yep. two and a half years after we bought it, this product was trading, trading in the, with the five in front of it. And so we sold it at a um, 
just under a six yeah. cap, a five nine five cap, and so that was a pretty good return. We planned a nine percent return for our investors on this investment, and we actually executed an eleven percent return yeah. on the on the project. So overall, so it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, and, and that like six cap exit. I don't know if we're going to see another. You know, we say that. We, I guess we've been saying that for a while. We just sold our apartment deals at. 4.1 and 4.4 cap rates. But that was uh, earlier in the year. That's not going to be in 2024. 30 days earlier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was in September. August and September. So but it's like... There's something about Q3 where things changed, I and, think. You know, normally Q3. for us, Q1 and Q3 are normally our best, our best quarters transaction-wise, whether that's a, a buyer, a, a sell, or anything. It's normally happened in those two quarters. We've, we've, we've tried to anything creatively to level that out, which has, <laughs> we have not figured out that special sauce in 15 years, but we would love to find a way to even out the year, but that's not the case. So it's first quarter, third quarter. Yeah, and, and honestly, with, with all of us too, my hope is that with every transaction, we're getting a little smarter and we're yeah. doing a little bit better. And so we're actually adding something to the yeah. knowledge base of so, relief. And yeah, so the, the valuation we see here, we sold, you know, just for a six cap, we're, we're looking at offers in the nine cap right now range that we're able to buy. Again, with issues and things we got to fix and, right. and not the perfect and, asset we're selling. And we're always, still buy, I mean, we're always, we're not the high price bidder. We're never the high price bidder. You are, the, the big yeah. mantra here is- Singles we, and doubles. We don't want to be the first offer accepted. Right. We want the first offer to kind of not work. Fizzle out. Fizzle out. Yeah. And then the broker comes back to us the second or third time and we say, oh, we're in second place. That's a good place to be. Oh, third place. Third place is even better, because when you're in third place for the oh, offer, gonna... it's a lot more. It's they're a lot more motivated. But at, at the same time, when we go to sell deals, we we almost never pick the highest price offer. We normally go with the most sure to close and the right. least likely to retrade us, which usually ends up being in second, third, maybe even fourth place. And that that discrepancy yeah. is hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you can't always trust that highest price guy. Yeah. So. There's a lot that goes yeah. into it beyond just the price. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, trying to do transactions uh, consistently uh, in volume over years. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's almost never that high price. It's like, how is this person going to execute? What's their track record? What groups are they using to execute the deal, whether it's their inspection group they're using or who's their property management group? You know, a lot of that goes into how we how we decide how we're going to transact on something. Well, I, I mean, a good example of that is Rosecroft. Actually, we went against we kind of went against our gut, went with the highest price offer, yeah. uh, went under agreement in January, late January, early February, didn't yeah. close until September. That was a long one. Yeah, it took about nine ish months to close. It was ups and downs. They changed lenders two or three times. It was it was exhausting. We closed, yeah, we made a, cu a couple, maybe we made an extra like hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars from it, but man, it was painful. Um, investors were kind of in this roller coaster of communication of like, hey, we're closing next week. No, we're closing next month. And, um, <laughs> or we don't even know right now. Or, yeah, is it going to happen at all? So, um, and the market was changing in the middle. So it all happened. It all worked out in hindsight. But it's it's a very risky proposition to like, will this work out when you go with the high price guy that has no experience? Yeah. yeah. So, cool. All right, well, that's it for this week. It's kind of a wrap when we get back to work. But uh, next week, we're going to have some more exciting updates. We'll have probably some demo pictures next week. We've got a lot of stuff coming online from a renovation standpoint. That's pretty cool. But right now, I'm going to get back to work. For more tips on operating and investing in real estate, please check us out at greenleafmanagement.com or find us on YouTube and Spotify.